So again, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm so pleased to welcome um, John Boyne to Politics and Prose to discuss his new book, The House's Special Purpose. Um, the novel starts in 1981 and travels back to the Russian Revolution um, to Georgie, the main character's unexpected role in the revolution, his escape to England, and his return to the places of his youth. Uh, John Banville, who's another Irish author that we love, said, John Boyne's novel is a tour de force, at once epic and intimate, and above all, a marvelous read. So take my word for it, take John Banville's word for it. This is a phenomenal book. And John, as many of you know, is the author of seven novels for adults and two for children. I'm so glad that he's here with us and that you're here with us as well. Please join me in welcoming John Boyne to Politics and Prose. Thank you. Um, nobody offered me a beer or wine. Uh, well, I didn't know you meant that. I thought you meant like a cup of tea. Um, no, I'm fine with this. I'm fine with this. Thank you. Afterwards. Afterwards. Anyway. Um, I feel like I'm in Europe, you know. That's, uh, the case. I can drink in the cinemas. Um, thank you uh, for coming out tonight. Um, this book, The House of Special Purpose, I'm, there's two sections I thought I'd read, a, a short section at the start and a slightly longer one in the middle, but just to put it in some context um, of where the book came from and how it started. A, a lot of my books seem to come from something that happened to me in childhood. And this started really many years ago when I was about 14. And I was staying with my grandfather for a couple of weeks in the summer holidays. And he had a great, a great library in his house. And one of the books he had was uh, Robert Massey's great biography of Nicholas and Alexandra, which I think remains kind of the definitive biography of, 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 the, of those two people and of the Russian Revolution, the lead up to the Russian Revolution. And I was only a kid, but I, you know, this book was about seven, 800 pages long and I read it. I felt very proud of myself for reading it and got completely lost in the, um, in the story. And and in Russia, you know, the, the wonderful drama and the color um, of, of these years leading up to the revolution and what happened there, and Rasputin, people like that. I absolutely loved it. But I, because I knew nothing about it when I started, when I got to the end of the book, and of course the assassination of the Romanovs happens, uh, which I hadn't expected, I didn't see coming, um, I was very moved by that. I was um, even quite upset by it, and it really stayed with me. And I was very moved by the idea of this family who were all together um, these, these parents, these children, teenagers, younger than teenagers, and the way that they died. And it always stayed with me, and I thought, as I started writing novels in my early 20s, and a lot of the novels I was writing was set in the past anyway, I always knew that at some point I would like to write about this period of history. A lot of the periods I choose are, are times that uh, I don't know much about when I start, but that I choose because I know I want to learn about, so I go on a research you know, for research it for a year or something, learn as much as I can. Half of this book takes place in St. Petersburg, and half of it takes place in the 60 years that followed the revolution. But the half that takes place in St. Petersburg, I wrote in St. Petersburg itself. Um, I actually wrote it in the Winter Palace um, of the Tsars. I would go down, I was there for a winter a few years ago, and would go down every morning with my laptop and just sit in different rooms of the palace and basically make it up, you know, as it went along. Um, it was, of all the novels I've written, I think the experience of writing this one was probably the most interesting to me uh, in, in just being part of that in a Russian winter, you know, feeling like I was in the middle of Anna Karenina or something, and um, just being in that palace, feeling the ghosts of those last people who lived there, um, hopefully finding their way onto the page. So I'm going to start by just reading um, a short section at the start to just put it in some context. Um, this is Yorgi, the narrator, who's actually narrating from the age of 82. Um, looking back at his childhood. My mother and father did not have a happy marriage. Years have passed since I last endured their company, decades, but they passed through my thoughts almost every day for a few moments, no longer than that. A whisper of memory, as light as Zoya's breath upon my neck as she sleeps by my side at night, as gentle as her lips against my cheek when she kisses me in the first light of morning. I cannot say when they died exactly. I know nothing of their passing other than the natural certainty that they are no longer of this world. But I think of them. I think of them still. I have always imagined my father, Daniel Vladievich, dying first. He was already in his early 30s by the time I was born, and from what I can recall of him, he was never blessed with good health. I have memories of waking as an infant in our small timber-framed Itzba in Kashin, 
pressing my hands to my tiny ears to repel the sound of his mortality as he choked and coughed and spat his phlegm into the fire burning in our small stove. I think now that he may have had a problem with his lungs, emphysema perhaps, it's difficult to know. There were no doctors to administer to him, no medicines. Nor did he bear his many illnesses with fortitude or grace. When he suffered, we suffered too. His forehead extended in a grotesque fashion from his head, I remember that also. A great mass of misshapen membrane protruding with smaller distensions on either side of it, the skin stretched taut from hairline to the bridge of the nose, pulling his eyebrows north to give him an expression of permanent disquiet. My older sister, Liska, told me once that it was an accident of birth, an incompetent doctor taking hold of the cranium as he emerged into the world, pressing too hard on the soft, not yet solidified bone beneath. Or a lazy midwife, perhaps, careless with another woman's child. His mother did not live to see the creature she had produced, the deformed baby with the misshapen skull, the experience of giving my father life cost my grandmother her own. This was not unusual then, and rarely a cause for grief. It was seen as a balance of nature. Today, it would be unexpected and worthy of litigation. My grandfather took another woman soon after, of course, to rear his young. When I was a boy, the other children in our village took fright when they saw my father walking along the road towards them, his eyes darting back and forth as he returned home. They had names for him, and it excited them to shout them in his direction. They feared no retribution for behaving like this in front of me, his only son. I have no reason to imagine it so, but I picture him returning home some evening, shortly after I made my escape from the railway carriage in Peskov on that cold March morning, and being set upon by Bolsheviks in retaliation for what I had done. I see myself rushing across the tracks and disappearing into the forest beyond in fear of my life, while he shuffles along the road for home, coughing, hacking and spitting, unaware that his own is in mortal danger. In my arrogance, I imagine that my disappearance brought great shame upon my family, a dishonour that demanded retribution. I picture a crowd of young men from the village. In my dreams, there are four of them. They are big and ugly and brutal bearing down upon him with cudgels, dragging him from the street toward the darkness of a high-walled lane in order to murder him without witness. I do not hear him crying out for mercy. That would not have been his way. I see blood on the stones where he lies. I glimpse a hand moving slowly, trembling, the fingers in spasm, and then lying still. When I think of my mother, Yulia Vladimirovna, I imagine her being called home to God in her own bed a few years later hungry and exhausted, with my sisters keening by her side. I cannot imagine what hardships she must have faced after my father's death, and I do not like to think of it, for despite the fact that she was a cold woman and betrayed her disappointment in me at every juncture of my childhood, she was my mother nevertheless, and such a person is holy. I picture my eldest sister, Asha, placing a small portrait of me in her hands as she clasped them together for the final time in prayer. The shroud is gathered to her thin neck, her face is white, her lips a pale shade of periwinkle blue. None of this may have happened, of course. The lives of my mother, my father, my sisters may have ended differently. There is no way for me to know. There was never a moment when I could have returned, never a chance I could have written. To return to them would have put them in danger, put Zoya in danger. But no matter how many years have passed, I think of them still. There are great stretches of my life that are a mystery to me. Decades of work and family, struggle, betrayal, disappointment that have blended together and are almost impossible to separate. But moments from those years, those early years, linger and resonate in my memory. And if they remain as shadows along the dark corridors of my aging mind, then they are all the more vivid and remarkable for the fact that they can never be forgotten, even if soon I will be. So that's how the, the story begins with Yorgi looking back um, at the opening years of his life. The novel has kind of an unusual structure because half of it, as I mentioned, is set in the three years leading up to 1918. The other half is set in the 60 years that follow it. And they take alternating chapters with one story moving forward in time and the other story, which is the story of Yorgi and his wife Zoya when they leave Russia and spend 60 years firstly in Paris, then in London. It tells their story backwards uh, from 1981 so that the two stories meet at the end. And in that section, it's, it's just scenes from their lives, really, just different years in their lives and what's happening to them, which is quite a, it was quite a 
difficult book to write in a way because I wrote it in the order it appears in the book. So I would be talking about things in those chapters which chronologically hadn't happened yet and in fact which I hadn't written yet because they were going to come at some point <laughs> down the line. So uh, you know, I had to keep it all in the air. Um, but it was really interesting to do that, to, to try to see could I, could I make an unusual structure like that work. So the second section I thought I'd read is, um, is one of the, the, the Russian sections. And it takes place, um, well, it, at this point, Yorgi, um, who has been born in this small village, uh, the, the novel opens with the cousin of the, of the Tsar, of Tsar Nicholas, coming through their village. And an assassination attempt is made on him. And through a set of circumstances, Yorgi, a narrator, uh, saves the Grand Duke's life. The Grand Duke knows that the Tsar is looking for a sort of bodyguard companion, someone closer in age to the Tsarevich Alexei. And he says, we'll take you. So he takes this boy, 16-year-old boy, to St. Petersburg. So he's taken from you know, poverty to luxury. Over the course of a couple of months, he's living with the imperial family. He's traveling with them. He's spending all his time in their company. So his life takes on a great change. Um, this scene takes place in um, a place called Stavka, which is the, the army headquarters. The family is on progress through, through Russia. During the time that Yorgi has been here, he's very surprised by the fact that the parents are so protective of the Tsarevich Alexei. Um, they don't treat him like a little boy, they don't let him play, and he doesn't know why. I didn't see the Grand Duke Nicholas Nikolaevich, whose life I had saved and whose appreci appreciation had brought me to my new life, until more than a week after we arrived at Stavka. When we did meet again, he had just returned from the front, where he had been leading the troops with varying degrees of success, and had come back to Mogilev to consult with his cousin, the Tsar, and to plan the autumn strategy. I had entered the house from the garden where Alexei was constructing a fort among some trees when I saw that great giant of a man marching along the corridor towards me. Yorgi Danilovich, he roared as he came closer. It is you, isn't it? It is, sir, I admitted, offering him a low, respectful bow. It's nice to see you again. Is it? he asked, sounding surprised. Well, I'm glad to hear it. So here you are then, he added, looking me up and down to decide whether he still approved of me. I thought it might work out. I said to Cousin Nicky, there's a boy I met in this little shit hole of a village, a very brave lad, not much to look at, it's true, could do it a few inches of height, a few more pounds of muscle, but not a bad fellow all the same. Might be exactly who you're looking for to take care of young Alexei. I'm glad to see he listened to me. You have my gratitude, sir, for the great change in my circumstances. Yes, yes, he said dismissively. Bit of a difference from, where was it? Kashin, sir. Oh yes, Kashin, dreadful place. Had to hang the fool who tried to shoot me. Didn't want to do it, really. He was just a boy. But there's no excuse for that. Had to be made an example of. You can understand that, can't you? I nodded, but said nothing. The memory of my part in Kolek's death was something I tried not to dwell on, for I felt guilty about how I had profited from it. Also, I missed his companionship. Friend of yours, was he? Asked the Grand Duke, sensing my reticence. We grew up together, I said. He had strange ideas sometimes, but he was not a malicious person. Not so sure about that, he replied with a shrug. He did point a gun at me, after all. Well, it's all in the past now, survival of the fittest and all that. Speaking of which, where is the Tsarevich, anyway? Aren't you supposed to be by his side at all times? He's just outside, I said, nodding my head in the direction of the copse, where the boy was dragging some logs across the grass to aid in the construction of the walls of his fort. He's all right out there on his own, is he? Asked the Grand Duke, and I couldn't help but sigh in frustration. I had been attending to the Tsarevich, for almost two months now, and had never known a child who was so wrapped in cotton wool. His parents behaved as if he might snap in two at any moment, and now the Grand Duke was suggesting he could not be left alone for fear of injury. He's just a boy, I wanted to shout at them sometimes, a child, when none of you ever children. I can go back out if you prefer it, I replied. I was only stepping inside to, no, no, he said quickly, shaking his head. I dare say you know what you're doing. I don't make it my business to tell another man's servant how to do his job. I bristled a little at this characterization. The Tsar's servant, was that what I was? Of course it was, I was hardly free. But still it was an unpleasant thing to hear the words said aloud. And you have settled into your new duties well, he asked. Yes, sir, I replied. Well, good for you, you're young and good God. The sudden change in his tone made me look up and I saw he was not looking at me anymore, but staring out the window towards the garden. Alexei was nowhere to be seen, however, and as I followed the direction of the Grand Duke's eyes, I caught sight of the boy, 
perhaps 15 feet off the ground, sitting on a thick branch which extended from an oak tree. Alexei, whispered the Grand Duke under his breath, the word filled with trepidation. Ho there, shouted the boy from his vantage point, his voice reaching us now, delighted by how high he had climbed. Cousin Nicholas, Yorgi, can you see me? Alexei, stay where you are, roared the Grand Duke, running out. Don't move, do you hear me? Stay where you are, I'm coming. I followed him outside, astonished by how seriously he seemed to be taking the matter. The boy had managed to get himself up the tree. It would hardly be any more difficult to get himself down again. And yet Nicholas Nikolaevich was sprinting towards the oak as if all our lives and the fate of Russia itself depended on our rescuing him. It was too late, however. The sight of this monster of a man charging towards him was too much for the boy, who tried to stand up and descend the trunk, but he caught his foot in a branch. And in a moment, I heard a surprised cry emerge from his lips as he struggled to find purchase on one of the smaller branches beneath him, before falling hard and noisily to the ground below, where he sat up, rubbed his head and elbow, and grinned at us both as if the entire thing had been a great surprise to him, but not an unpleasant one. I smiled back. He was fine, after all. No harm had been done. Be quick, said the Grand Duke, turning to look at me, his face pale. Call the doctors. Get them here now. But he's fine, sir, I I protested, surprised by how seriously he was taking this. Look at him. All he did was, get them now, he roared, practically knocking me over in his anger. And this time I did not hesitate. I turned. I ran. I summoned help. And within a few minutes, the entire household had come to a dramatic stop. And then later in the evening, there was a full moon that night. And I found myself standing in the same spot where I had been talking with the Grand Duke earlier in the afternoon. I heard the footsteps marching along the corridor for some time before I thought to turn and look in their direction. There was an urgency to them, a determination that made me nervous. Who's there? I called. Who's there? Make yourself known. As I said this, the figure emerged into the brightness, and before I had a chance to catch my breath, she was standing directly before me, raising her hand in the air, and with one sharp and determined motion, she struck me forcefully across the face. So taken by surprise was I, by both the strength and the unexpected nature of the act, that I fell out of my stance, tripping backward and stumbling onto the floor, landing painfully on my elbow. But I made no cry, merely sat there, dazed, and nursing my wounded jaw. You fool, said the Tsaritsa, taking another step towards me, and I retreated a little, although I didn't think she intended to strike me again. You stupid fool, she repeated, her voice devastated from anger and fear. Your Majesty, I said, standing up now, but keeping a safe distance from her. I keep telling people it was an accident. I don't know how it... We cannot afford accidents, she shouted. What is the point of you if you do not look after my son, if you do not keep him from harm? The point of me, I asked, certain that I did not care for the expression, even if it did come from the Empress of Russia. I cannot keep my eyes on him at every moment of the day. He's a boy. He looks for adventure. He fell from a tree. This is what they tell me, she replied. What was he doing in a tree in the first place? He climbed it, I explained. The Tsarevich was building a fort. I expect he was looking for wood, and... Why were you not with him? You should have been with him. I shook my head and looked away, unable to understand how she could think I could possibly be always by the boy's side. He was an active fellow, no matter what they thought of him. He escaped me constantly. Yorgi, said the Tsaritsa, putting her hands to her cheeks now and holding them there for a moment. Yorgi, you don't understand. I told Nikki we should have explained it to you. Explained what? Tell me, please. Just listen, she said, putting a finger to her lips for a moment, and I looked around, waiting to hear something that might explain things. What is it? I asked. I hear nothing. I know, she said. It is silent now. There's not a sound. But in an hour's time, perhaps less, these corridors will echo with the sound of my son's cries as the first agonies begin. The blood around his wounds will fail to clot, And then he will start to suffer. And you might think you have never heard such anguished cries, but, she released a small bitter laugh, they will be nothing in comparison to what will follow. It was not a heavy fall, I protested, hearing the weakness of my words, for I had started to realise that perhaps there was a reason for such protectiveness. A few hours later, and the real pain will begin, she continued. The doctors will not be able to stem the flow of blood, for his wounds are all internal. And it is impossible to operate upon him, for we cannot allow him to bleed more freely. Having no natural release, the blood will flow into Alexei's muscles and joints, trying to fill spaces that are already full, expanding those injured areas even further. 
He will start to suffer in ways that neither you nor I can possibly imagine. He will cry out and then he will scream. He will scream for a week, perhaps longer. Can you imagine what it must be like to scream for a week, Jorgi? I stared at her and said nothing. Of course I couldn't imagine it. The idea was beyond imagination. And throughout this time, he will drift in and out of consciousness, but mostly he will be awake to experience the pain, she continued. His entire body will go into seizure and he will become delirious. He will be torn between nightmares, between screaming out in, pr in pain and praying for his father or I to help him, to relieve some of his suffering. But there will be nothing we can do. We will sit by his bedside, we will talk to him, we will hold his hand, but we will not cry because we cannot be weak in front of the child. And this will happen for who knows how long. And then do you know what might happen, Yorgi? I shook my head. What? I asked. Then he might die, she said. My son might die. Russia might be left without an heir. And all because you allowed him to climb a tree. Do you understand now? So. Thank you. Um, so I'll stop there. And um, that's really the story of... of uh, it's enough to tell you, I think, about it, hopefully to, to get you interested in it. So maybe I'll open it up to you if you have questions you'd like to ask about this book or um, previous books or writing in general. I'm happy to take them. Yes? What made you decide to uh, write it in the order in which it appears in the book as opposed to writing it in chronological order and then arranging it the way it appears? Um, I did it because I thought, I, I gave it a lot of thought before I started. And I felt that... Um, if I wrote it the other way and then put it all back in order, I didn't think it would work for the reader. I thought there'd be something there subconsciously that would feel forced in some way. And I thought it would be more interesting the other way around. Um, I, 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 I just didn't think it was, uh, I thought it was a slightly dishonest way to write it, that if the book was going to read backwards, then it should be written backwards. I didn't know if it was gonna work or not. I didn't know if I'd be able to do it. But after a couple, I think there's eight, maybe nine sections like that that work backwards. And um, once I'd written two or three of them, I felt quite comfortable with it because they were almost self-contained stories. There's maybe eight, nine years between, between each one. And uh, while they, of course, refer both backwards and forwards um, in terms of time and the book, they're very specific to their, to their years as well. Yes. Yeah. When you were doing your research, did you see how many other um, royal families were gifted the Queen of Sabrina? Yeah, um, quite a few. It's, it's, um, it affects the male bloodline as it goes down. And of course, what Queen Victoria did was basically marry off all her children, and she had, you know, 53 of them or something. Um, <laughs> she, you know, she married them all off to every royal house in Europe. So once it came down a generation, um, practically, or two generations, practically every sovereign of a European nation's grandparent was Queen Victoria. So they were all intermarried, they were all interbred. Spain had quite a bit of it, Greece had quite a bit of it. Um, it, it, it does seem to kind of keep reappearing. Um, it seems to, it hasn't hit the, the English royal family as of yet, hopefully. So, um, but, it, it, but I think the most famous instance, of course, is, is probably Alexei, even though he died as a child. Thanks for your reading. Um, you said, so you wrote this book while staying in Russia and writing in the Winter Palace. Had you written your other works by going to the places you were writing about or what inspired this trip? And did you, just what about it? Um, I, I hadn't always, and I learned a, a lesson in a way after writing, um, when I wrote uh, an earlier book, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, uh, I hadn't been to a concentration camp until after I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. and, and that was because the, the writing of that book came about very, very quickly over the course of a few days. And the book was there in front of me before I almost knew what it was I had. But uh, And after that, I resolved any time I was writing about somewhere, then I should really be there. And so that's, that's what I've done ever since. I wrote this in um, St. Petersburg, this my most recent children's book, the Terrible Thing That Happened to Barnaby Brockett was written in Sydney, Australia, um, in the house that Barnaby lives in. Um, it, you know, I wrote a lot of The Absolutist in some of it anyway in, in, um, in northern France. 
I mean, it was hard, like, earlier on, and, you know, when I was a younger writer, it, it would have been very difficult to just sort of go off and <laughs> live in places. I had a job, you know, to pay the rent. Um, <laughs> But um, I think if you are writing about the past or other places, places that you're not from, and I haven't written about Ireland uh, in, in, a, in a novel as yet, then it, it just seems more sensible to go there and, and experience it and feel, feel what it's really like to be there. Uh, my question, um, oh. you kind of uh, just touched on it. It has to do with the, the book market and what people expect. American audiences in my experience, we're in a, a book group that reads contemporary Irish fiction. And so there's, there's this general expectation that Irish writers are supposed to write about Ireland. Um, uh, we saw Nick Laird a few years ago, and he said, it's funny, when I write novels, I'm British. When I write uh, poetry, they call me Irish. <laughs> but so I'm just wondering a couple of things. There are a lot of Irish authors, new, newer novels, that aren't sold over here. And I think sometimes it's because the theme is too foreign to uh, maybe an American audience. And then you have your books, which are very different. And I, uh, I think you're a brilliant writer. Uh, the, the, absolute, the Absolutist was just wonderful um, writing. I'm just kind of wondering how that plays out for you you know, coming here to the U.S., what pe what American audiences expect, and yet we can buy your books here, and maybe it's because the the themes are more universal. Am I yeah. making sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, firstly, um, it's great to hear that you're in a book group that's studying contemporary Irish yeah, it novels. Has to be, uh, now it has to be after the year 2000. I just okay. <laughs> what 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 book is it at the moment? Okay. Um, well, you know what you said is, is is very true as well. You know when um, when an Irish novelist wins the Booker Prize, they're they're British, and when they're found, you know, drunk in a drunk in a gutter, they're Irish. Um, th that's just the way it seems to work. But uh, I think there, from my perspective as an as an Irish writer, um, there's a couple of problems. Firstly, whenever you know, I travel a lot. I go to a lot of festivals and do book tours in many different countries. And I'm always getting asked why I don't write about Ireland. And an American writer or a British writer will not get asked that. The assumption is if you come from a small country, you should be writing about that country. But if you come from somewhere like America, you're given the freedom to write about anything you like. And I don't know why that's the case. David Mitchell, great English writer, um, his, lo his most recent novel was set in Japan. Nobody would ask David, you know, why aren't you writing about England? Um, but we're expected to write about Ireland because we're from a small country. Same thing happens if you're, you know, if you're French, if you're Australian, you know, any place that um, is not, I think, Britain or America, they, they don't, they expect you to uh, write that way. There's also a problem, I think, in American publishing, a very big problem, which is that um, you have almost, uh, American publishers have almost no interest in translations. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty bad in the British publishing market, but it's even worse here. Uh, you know, there's, you, you can't read contemporary French novels, you can't read contemporary Greek novels, Dutch novels, Italian novels. It, it just, you know, w there'll be a couple every year, the major ones that win some big prize. Um, but, you know, I'm not saying it's not just America, it's pretty bad at home as well, but I think it's worse here. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's publishing's fault. Um, and it's, you know, it's also down to readers to ask publishers for those books, I think. Um, what was the other part? There was more to that question. Uh, uh, oh, th that the American market doesn't sell a lot. Oh of yeah, yeah. What do they expect? Well, yeah. I mean, it's true. I mean, of my generation in, in Ireland, say the say the thirty something, you know, thirty to forty age group, um, most of whom are writing about Ireland. They're not getting published over here. Most of my friends aren't getting published over here, and if they are getting published, they may be being bought for like. $2,000 or something, and there's no marketing budget, and, and the book doesn't do anything, and they, they don't get another one. Um, I don't know. I think it's just fear among publishers. You know, they, they, they just, it's a very, um, I, I, I had a conversation yesterday with my agent about the fact that I, I had um, 
because I write for kids as well, my American publisher was making an offer for the next kids' book, but as a two-book deal. And I'd made a suggestion about what the second one would be. And there was a fear that it just wasn't universal enough as a subject. But, you know, I, I, I can't write for a specific market. I can't write for readers. I can only write the book I want to write. Anytime I'm in a university class or something with student writers, um, I always say to them that if you write a good book, then that book will find a publisher and it will find readers. And you have to believe that. If you don't believe it, there's no point writing the thing. Um, you, have no, you can't control it. The only thing you can control as a writer is the book that you're writing. You can't control whether an American publisher is going to buy it, a British publisher, you know, a German publisher. You can't control that. You can't control whether it will sell once it's out there. So actually, as life goes on as a published novelist, you have to let those things shake off your shoulders as well and, and not care very much. You know, you're not writing necessarily to become a megastar or something or to make millions and millions and millions of, 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 of euros or dollars. You're writing to build a body of work. And if that doesn't reach an audience now, it doesn't. And if an Irish writer can't get published in America now, they can't. But a lot of those Irish writers will go on and win the Booker or the Costa or something, and then they'll be automatically picked up and their backlist will, will come out. Yeah. Was it ever overwhelming or tempting to include all of that? How do you balance that? Yeah, it becomes a very instinctive thing that um, I've done a lot of research really for all the novels I've written. They've all been kind of research based. And um, I'm always conscious as I'm writing them that I'm not writing a work of nonfiction. You know, this is a novel, it's made up, most of it. And your first responsibility is to the story you're telling, not necessarily to the absolute historic facts. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not going to have the czar flying in on a plane or something. But if I put him, if I put him in a place he wasn't at a time he wasn't, in order to serve the story, I think that's okay. I mean, once you start writing a historical novel with a fictional character at the centre of it, that world is already corrupted. He never existed. The time did, but he didn't. What I do is I I, um, I start off. I don't actually start off by reading nonfiction. I start off by reading novels which were written at the time in the place. So I started off reading. Russian literature. And I do that because if you read con novels which are written contempor contemporaneously with your novel, you find language that has perhaps gone out of style, phrases, turns of phrase, the way people talk to each other. Um, so I'm looking for small things like you know, how people travel from place to place. Does a man stand up when a woman walks into the room? You know, all these little, little uh, things that you won't find on Wikipedia. You know, but that you'll find you'll you'll read you'll be reading Anna Karenina, and it'll be just something will happen. You'll say that must be how people behaved then. You make a note of it. So I start with novels, then I go on to nonfiction. I read like for this, I went back and read the Robert Massey again. Um, I read a couple of books about the Russian Revolution. I didn't overload myself with it. I have to say, you know, I read what I felt I needed to read, and and a point comes where just instinctively you have to put all that aside. You have to take it off the desk, and you have to start writing the story. And once I start doing that on any historically based book, I don't look at anything else as I'm writing the first draft. I just write the draft, get from start to finish. I don't, I don't look back. I don't rewrite as I'm going. I just plow my way through right to the end. And when I get to the end, then I know the things that I don't know, if you know what I mean. You know, I know, I know then, OK, I, I, as I was writing that bit about, um, about the, the army camp, I don't know what the army camp looks like. I need to find out something about that. Um, so all the little, all that little stuff comes at the end, and then then you go and you you research more specifically, or in my case as well, then you go to or while I was doing it, being over there, and I could ask questions of people. Um, so it becomes, I think, the more you do it, it just becomes quite instinctive. You know the moment when if you don't start writing soon, you're going to get bored by the whole thing. You know, it's it's just time to put all that nonfiction off the desk and start writing. I'm just curious, uh, who was your favorite character to write about in this book, and why? Um, well, Rasputin was fun to write about. <laughs> but the difficulty about writing him was that he was so much fun to write about that I had to pull myself back on him quite a bit, because otherwise he could have dominated the story. And it's not his story. Um, he's supposed to be a supporting character in it. 
but every I think he's only got about maybe four long scenes in the book, but each one of them, uh, I could have just kept writing his voice. You know, it was quite good fun to write him. So that was, um, but I, so I had to stop myself there. Um, I liked writing the narrator's voice because, as I say, he was 82. The, the novel I'd written previous to this, immediately previous, was a novel about the bounty. And it was narrated by a 14-year-old who was uneducated. And so his language was wild and crazy. He made up words. It was explosive in its linguistic turns. And when I got to the end of that, I really I couldn't do that again. I wanted to quieten everything down. So I thought I'd write this novel from the point of view of not just an 82-year-old man, but one for whom English was not his first language. And he has spent his entire adult life working in the British Museum. So he's quite, he's quite, um, I, I thought of him as a very elegant sort of man, and he would speak elegantly. You know, there'd be no flab in the book. Every sentence would be very careful. Um, and I think w when I did that, I think that was a very, um, I think it improved my writing by trying to do that, you know, by really trying to kind of calm everything down and not make it so, so, so wild. So he, he was quite, quite good to write. Okay. Well, thank you to John. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.